Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry. I'm a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. All right, I'm super excited about today's topic because it is in my top three favorite topics historically to talk and learn about, and that's the Mongol Empire. So Alternate History Hub did a video, and this one's called, What If the Mongol Empire Never Existed? All right, largest empire in history, land-based at least, and a lot of ways ushered in the modern era. So this should be fun to speculate about. All right, original video is down below. Make sure you're supporting them. Give that video a view, a like, and let's get started. I know it's going to sound cliche, but one of the reasons the Mongols are so interesting is kind of what John Green said is in uh, in in Crash Course World History, which is they're the exception. And man, what a interesting little part of history, right? All right, let's do this. It's going to be fun to talk about the history behind this. The great man theory is a pretty outdated approach towards history, which sees great people oh, yeah. as the primary mover of events, the engine that drives the masses and creates vast empires and historical events. All that. The internet's still doing this too. Message boards, history nerds, where it's like just like getting obsessed with individuals of history. You, you don't need to do that. All right, just study it, appreciate it, understand the effects. Okay, you don't got a fanboy. <laughs> Real history is kind of more complex than that. Every revolution, discovery, invention, man-made disaster is the result <laughs> of a long series of precursors. However, there are a few exceptions. Historical figures that give some- I'm not the only one that immediately thought of the, the clip of Crash Course, right? Because he said exception in the Mongol context. The, the, the movie scene. <laughs> level of credence to this theory. People like Alexander, Caesar, Napoleon, but above all, Genghis Khan, a meritocratic, genocidal, yeah. brilliant, and merciless chieftain. Who's if you're gonna great man history, Genghis, okay, be sure you, and you're gonna like try to use his influence in your own life, be very selective about the things that you may want to decide about him. <laughs> all right. Same with all those guys they showed up because there's guys who completely devoted themselves to being the next Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar. That's like Napoleon, you know, would do that. And it's like spread his dude, chills and destruction all over Eurasia. But what if that never happened? What if someone took a time machine and killed him when he was a baby in order to save millions of lives or something like that? Before we take him out yeah. of the picture, though, I really need to emphasize how unique this person really was. Just think about this. For centuries, if not Yerps. millennia, the life on the steppe was virtually unchanged. Groups of it's people true. living off giant herds of animals, using the barter system, and raiding settlements from time to time. And in the case of Mongolia, we are talking about one of the coldest places on the planet. To this day, the life of the Mongolian people hasn't changed all that much. It's hard to yeah, find a better one. time capsule to test this theory on. And that's it's one of the few places that still has that extensive nomadic culture. So like you were saying, the geography of Mongolia is very interesting because, like I said, agriculture doesn't work there. But it's amazing for grazing animals. Amazing for grazing animals. Tons of, of grasslands that, again, you can, you can feed your animals with. And then anything they need to trade with, usually they would trade with China. Uh, that was their big trading partner and they could raise animals and whatever and trade that for, you know, um, agricultural products. That's how they had their relationship. And for a lot of times, the Mongols and their ancestors had, had good, uh, good negotiations, good terms, but also not very. Um, and if things are difficult, if there's famine or uh, uh, famine, there's drought, for example, stuff isn't growing. That's when you start to see, you know, the Mongols uh, stuff and, and the nomadic re uh, people of those regions really start to uh, pressure in and invade and stuff like that. And suddenly, bam, very much tied this to Genghis ecology. Khan character comes along, breeds extreme Timogen. levels of loyalty, abandons tribalism, creates a new code of law, adopts meritocracy, and raises any civilization to the ground that dares that to oppose. mess with his messengers. That opposes him. When the dust finally settles and his scattered people adopt foreign customs, all returns to normal and people in Mongolia turn back to their old ways on the steppe. It's yeah. amazing because you're talking about like the largest connected empire in history and it was short-lived, you know, um, at least as, as an actual connected empire only lasted a couple generations, but um, the influence will be great. But it's like, if you, it's amazing because if you go to Mongolia today, you would never be like, 
man, the largest empire, this great empire in history was once ran from here. It's because it's totally different than all the other empires we think of. We can go to Rome and see all the ruins. You're not going to see that in Mongol Empire. You'd have to read a book. Some aliens came down or something and, and were trying to learn the history and couldn't read writing. They would never have any idea that there was such an empire. Uh, like Khan this. certainly left his mark on the world in more ways than one. Old Khan did so much uh, conquering throughout Asia that today he has literally millions of descendants. But most of our ancestors aren't brutal conqueror uh one in 200 people are direct descendants of genghis khan yeah go ahead and think about that if you are uh from the mongol empire okay like today if you live somewhere mongol empire was uh big it it can get up to like one eighth one eighth of people are direct descendants yeah most of us just don't know anything about them. And that's where this video sponsor comes in. My <laughs> that's, a, that's a good. I've uh, been fascinated with my own ancestors. That's a good one to, to do because uh, to do for this because of the, the progeny and the, 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 the genealogy of the Mongol influence. Um, you know, they've been able to trace that DNA markers. That's how they've they've they know some of these numbers. So anyways, um, uh, go to the original video, please, to support if you want to uh, uh, do this ancestry stuff. This stuff is always really cool. Always fun to learn your ancestry, see who you're related to, and, you know, all those sorts of things. So, all right. All right, going to get kill count? Is that coming up? Oh, gosh. Um, if I remember, around 40 million. Yeah, which is insanely high percentage of the world's population and for uncover the your 13th century. Today. According to some estimates, the Mongol incursions resulted in the death of 40 to 60 million people, or 11% of the world population, oh. <laughs> which doesn't even include the death toll from the Black Plague, I was gonna say, which yeah. came about because of the globalization the Mongols accelerated. Between the One of the crazy stories about Mongols spreading the plague was the siege of Kaffa in Crimea, Crimea, where the Mongols launched plague-infected bodies. That's a port city, um, and was likely very possible uh, to be how it, it eventually got into Europe was they launched uh, when they were sieging the city, launched their own plague infected bodies into the city and that's a port city. So the disease spread and then got on ships and that was Kaffa was uh, where you load ships from the Silk Road and then send them into like Italy. And then it hits Italy in the port cities first. The Scythians, Zhongyu, Huns, Cumans, and countless other nomadic people, maybe even combined. None have wrecked as much damage to other civilizations as the Mongols did. Nope. And that genie would have never left the regional bottle if it wasn't for Genghis. So what happens if we just Thanos snap him out of existence? <laughs> Turns out that's not as unlikely as you might think. Like all the previously mentioned great figures, he also had thick plot armor. Before he became Genghis Khan, Temujin was Temujin. the son of Yesugi, chieftain of the Borjgin clan. Genghis Khan means like universal ruler. Khan is like a king. It's like king of the universe kind of thing. One of many, many tribes roaming around the steppe. The boy was 10 when his father was poisoned, and his age prevented him from taking his father's place. Instead, Mom he was, was kidnapped thrown a bunch out of into times. the wild to fend for himself. He was taken prisoner by rival clans several times. They, they did that a lot. Each time that was so common. You would you would you would go and kidnap people. And his mom did it had a bunch of times. Just like what you did, and then you returned him. Now <laughs> managing to escape, and in 1204, he was even struck in the neck with an arrow by a man who would later become one of his greatest commanders. <laughs> Instead of looking for the perfect Jib. opportunity to kill Genghis, let's just assume that any one of those dozen chances led to okay, his downfall before he was able to let's unite to the and drill the Mongols into one happened? of the greatest armies the world has ever seen. As far as timeline changes go, the this is easily one of the most impactful. So much so, we kind of have to break it down one region yeah, at a time. There's so many things I want to introduce with, but uh, I'll let them let do it and interject. Okay, China, huge influence. Speaking of China, at the time, Hardest it was divided place to into them. two almost equally years. large domains. The Jin, which spawned from the Jerkin tribes who revolted against their overlords, and conquered half of China almost a century earlier, and the surviving Song Dynasty, which moved its capital to Hongzhou. One of the greatest the two dynasties. states were China's in perpetual history. war, and on the eve of the Mongol invasions, caught a stalemate. In our timeline, this rapid Mongol expansion was very similar to how the early Islamic invasions occurred, annihilating two rival empires who had exhausted themselves. This showcased the shortcomings of both the Jin 
and the song, but ultimately, the Jin were foreign invaders who were more interested in getting tributes than ruling a complicated bureaucracy. With I'm, I'm going to front load something just to, to think about that you know what I'm thinking about. I think the place that would have been uh, most affected in this timeline would be the Abbasids, the Muslims. Um, uh, cause that siege of Baghdad just completely wiped them out on the, the greatest city probably in the world at that time. Uh, yeah, the Abbasid Caliphate, I think they would have been, that would have had the biggest impact. Without Mongol interference, it is China, extremely likely that like most nomadic regimes before them, the Jin were going to crumble, leading to yet another, even more fragmented period Song of Chinese history, or more likely a reunified Song Dynasty. Probably. To accomplish this feat, the Song would have to fix their fundamental flaw, the one that prevented them from topping the Tang as the most successful dynasty Bureaucracy, in our I timeline. Think. Building a military, yeah. overcoming the existential Jin crisis, is fully because within the realm of possibility. Potentially, it could lead to another golden age, an incredibly powerful China. Um, the Tang Dynasty came before the Song Dynasty, and were the most militaristic uh, dynasty in all of Chinese history. They they expanded incredibly far um, into Central Asia. They went down south, up north. They were the most militarily, you know, uh, um, uh, aggressive but it also can lead to your downfall too like the song were into a very complicated expensive bureaucracy that ended up hurting them a little bit a very expensive government but again not as militarized but i hope he's not you know here don't under, don't underestimate the song military though it still had good technology it was still quite good but to compare it to the tang yeah i mean that's hard to do and it's the most militarized dynasty in history instead in of the history. pathetic excuse of a dynasty that we got with the mongol yuan speaking of which the last despite what years. the clickbait titles would have you believe <laughs> the mongols never invaded japan at least directly it was they actually tried. the yuan dynasty they tried twice. started by kublai khan I launched two massive invasions made up of Chinese and Korean soldiers, who then failed to overcome the Divine Wind and Japanese resistance. Without Genghis Khan, there is no Mongol Empire, and thus no Yuan Dynasty, so Japan never gets invaded in the first place. If you didn't know, Yuan Dynasty is the Chinese dynasty that is Mongol. It's the, they rule it for about a hundred years which would end up having massive consequences. You see, there is a major chunk of Japanese identity that can be traced back oh, to yeah. their defense against what they saw as this overwhelming force. Nature's like on their the side. Greeks fighting off the Persian Empire. These moments were etched into the consciousness of the island dwellers and led to a rise in militarism and isolationism. The shogunate implemented policies to limit contact with the outside world, which outlived the Yuan dynasty itself. Well, and that's gonna be a bigger effect of that isolation was when Europeans started showing up in the 1500s. That's when they start to actually really lock down. Um, yeah, was with that. They, they didn't want to be exploited. They saw what Europeans had done to, you know, like the Philippines and completely just like, took them over and see the exploitation elsewhere. Um, that was the bigger influence of them really going lockdown mode. A more open Japan, occasionally trading with China and Korea, uh, that is less dependent on samurai and martial prowess. It's kind of hard to imagine. I don't think so. As those were its defining features up until the Meiji Restoration. But in this alternate timeline, that is a potential possibility. Yeah, Let's get the the, the, the European showing up was uh, I'm just gonna say on my my side um, much bigger thing they they wouldn't have stayed open because they're 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 gonna be around uh, pretty here pretty soon next couple centuries so Islamic world and India okay India they never invade India but the Islamic world very different um, if the Mongols don't show up out of the this is the one first. I think should be at the no biggest Jimmy impact. the Mongols didn't end the Islamic Golden Age no the Khwarezmian Empire Jimmy the Mongols didn't end the Islamic Let's get the misconceptions out of the way first. Ooh. No, Jimmy, the Mongols didn't end the Islamic Golden Age. No, the Khwarezmian Empire wouldn't endure, even if it wasn't brutally sacked. Islam probably would still make its way into India, since the Delhi Sultanate was did. established long before Timur and Babur came onto the scene. And hey, while we're at it, no, the Mamluks didn't stop the Mongols in Anjalut, since that was a B-Squad army under a lesser general dealing sure. with the side quest they still beat them and the mongols never went back the mongols came out of egypt so the mongols got into mesopotamia eventually get beaten back they were spread too thin 
But it, the Abbasid Caliphate was the center. It was the caliphate. It was the leader of Islam. It, it was that. There was no caliphs like after that. It was the end of the caliphate. Like it's over. There was no leadership. Up to that, there had been these caliphs and somewhat of a succession of Islamic leadership. It was the Islamic Golden Age under Bagd- uh, centered out of Baghdad. Um, that destruction was incredibly destructive. It scattered the world scholars who had so many of them had been centralized in Baghdad. They're going to go. A lot of them are going to go to India. Some are going to go west across to, you know, Egypt, North Africa. Um, there's a, I mean, maybe I'm misinformed on this, but uh, it, and it totally ended the Islamic golden age. While opinion. the whole empire was prepping for a civil war. There was no okay, leadership. So all of that out of the way, what actually does change? Khwarezmia was reaching the point of overextension, Their empire sucked arrogance, anyways. that would ultimately bring about his downfall, making it just another one of those rise and fall stories in what is now and, Iran. And the They're Khwarezmians are not part of the Islamic Golden Age that way. It's it's an Abbasid Caliphate. It's not the Khwarezmians. Throughout history, empires came and went, but what remained were the dominant cultural centers in Central Asia that were beacons of scientific thought and commercial trade. Most of these cities you've never heard of before. Old Samarkand. But they had bigger populations than London, Paris, yeah. and Rome. That always Samarkand, surprises me. Nishapur, Ray, Isfahan, Merv, Urgench, Bukhara. Cities like these that didn't bend the knee were raised to the ground. Even Because you'd hear of all of them. The Khwarezmian Empire was stupid. They were the ones who were like killing Mongol like envoys and caravans. And because of that, they just they completely wiped them out and and claimed to be a scourge from God that way. Amazing, man. Central Asia, man, we just don't think of it today. It's like everyone thinks about when with civilization. It's like you you have like the Middle East, and then it's like nothing until China as you're going east. But like that center of the world, because it's the golden age of the of the uh, of the, uh, of, the uh, of the of the Silk Road. Like the modern city was basically built because of the Silk Road, where it's. Uh, ethnically diverse, diver- diversification of products and people, you know, um, just after the Mongols were right? long gone, these centers were just never the same again. Much like Constantinople lost a majority of its power and influence after the sack of 1204. According to some scholars, the Mongols killed Crusades between fail. 75 to 90 percent of the Persian population. We're talking millions of people here, like genocidal levels, all because Baghdad of- itself had uh, about a quarter million civilians and stuff just slaughtered governor they they the the um mayor or whatever you call him of, of baghdad or whatever at that time uh the position whatever that was called um surrendered the city and the, like and the civilians and then the mongols just slaughtered all of them decided to cut the hair of a mongol envoy and then there's the cultural aspect Look, the House of Wisdom in Baghdad was way past its prime because of the egregious corruption in the Abbasid Caliphate. But it also okay. still stored a monumental That's the most important. amount of knowledge. A 16th century historian even mentions that the Tigris changed its color to black due to the amount of books that were thrown in it during the sack of 1258. Of this loss of knowledge is comparable but. to the destruction of the Library of Alexandria. It, it's, it's Alexandria 2.0. I mean, it was it was had the best collection there of of things and never recovered from that. Never recovered from that. Who knows what we lost there? Uh, remember, it's the Abbasids and stuff that were um, oh just. Muslims as torchbearers had been pr- preserving uh, like Greek history and Greek science and all that stuff during the the, um, the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages. Uh, they were housing all of that ancient knowledge that came from the West. Oh, how many tomes Probably were lost, lost to the ages. How impactful they could have been if even a fraction of them were translated and distributed during the Renaissance. True. On the other hand, That's why it's the hard to predict happened. exactly where this region would go because of how static it was. The Abbasids and Ayyubids were plagued with corrupt and fragmentation. Both were at the mercy of foreign nomadic tribes that called the shots. The spread of Islam into India would certainly be impeded, since in this timeline there would be no Mughals to come onto the scene. But by far, the biggest... True, I mean, well, the Mughals are descendants of, um, uh... You know, the Mongols, too. I mean, that term Mughal, I believe it's Persian for for Mongol descendants of it. So there wouldn't have been then. They came out of um, Afghanistan, kind of out of Kabul. So, yeah, I mean, nothing would have changed with Islam in India. You'd just you'd have the Delhi Sultanate. I mean, they still came down to this region would be the fact that there would be no Ottomans. 
Oh yeah, you heard that right. Your favorite onion-wearing, cannon-firing Ottomans don't get to become a thing if not for the absolute smackdown at the Battle of Kasadag in 1243. And what can only be described as a bonus mission, Could have been the another one, sent though. a detachment another to deal group. with the Sultanate of Rum after its sultan refused to cross the continent to pay homage personally in Karakorum. This state, which broke Karakorum, off from the capital Celtic of the Empire, Mongols was the very time. reason the crusading movement began in the first place. It had bested the Byzantines, swarms of crusaders, even Georgia, not you, only to then be decimated by one Mongol incursion. Afterwards, they made Trebizond and Silica their vassal states, leaving the rest of Anatolia in absolute chaos. It was there in that primordial pot of Balix and confusion that the Ottomans were born. Rising above all the others, a rewrite of the reboot of the Seljuk Empire. And so, the downfall of one Temujin not only erases Kublai Khan, Timur, and Babur and from Osman, existence, but also Suleiman. Osman, Mehmed, and Suleiman, along with all that they achieved. This leads Constantinople. That's to, I mean, wouldn't the Abbasids probably have, have filled that? They could have. It still would have been like Islamic dominated, it just would be the Turks, maybe. Um, the Turks, though, still existed in the steppe. I mean, they remember they moved in, they were not native. The place that they ruled, they were not native to. They were from the Central Asian steppe. They moved into Anatolia and down there. So, um, could have been another group. But yeah, I still kind of, I think, would say the Abbasids would maybe be the ones then to, to keep pushing against the Byzantine Empire. Would they take over Constantinople, like 1453 Turks? I don't know. Noble, or at least the shadow of what it once Do the was Romans keep Christian existing? Hands. But since we mentioned Georgia, once again, not you, I'd like to say that <laughs> it would have a very different fate. One a lot less tragic than an art. Georgia, one. no Georgia, I mean, come no Stalin. Came up with this. A mountainous kingdom that excels at winemaking and church building, that becomes a bastion of Christianity in the face of wave after wave of Islamic invaders. Just entered a golden age under Queen Tamar. And what happens next? The Mongols invade and completely batter her successor, <laughs> leave it in ruins. After centuries of being a piece on the board, the kingdom of Georgia <laughs> finally got its shot. Really? Ready to become you think so? A regional power and change the local dynamics at I, a time. I don't know a lot about Georgian history. To be with honest. internal strife, the king was prepping to send a vast force to aid the Crusader states. The queen before him made a wouldn't have mattered probably right by supporting Trebizond. And in its reconquest. Hell, who knows where things might have gone if the Mongols just didn't it's spoil everything. Georgian Empire. What makes this even more tragic is that instead of getting its moment in the sun, Georgia spent the next millennia being slapped around by the Iranians, Ottomans, and Russians. <laughs> oh my. Hang on. Iranians, Ottomans, Russians. The absence of Genghis all Khan rolled, all the invaded. first, canceled the second. But what about, oh, there's no Russia without the Mongols. Yeah, I was going to say, what's going to happen to them? I mean, Kiev and Rus and like stuff like that, like groups that came before that, maybe they would have grown and Russia could have grown stronger. I mean, they were just under occupation by uh, by the Mongols for centuries. It was the place, by the way, that the Mongols ruled the, the, the longest uh, was Russia. I mean, they were paying tribute, especially. That was the big thing. Is they were a tribute state for the most part, but definitely saw puppets of leadership and what today would be, you know, Moscow and stuff. So uh, I think they could have built up sooner um, than they did. It's well established Russia. that the Kievan Rus were the predecessors of Russia. Its people were descended from Norsemen, using a complex river system yep. to trade Taking their long ships the Black Sea coast. They were about as unified as the Holy Roman Empire. The Vikings brought their culture and way of life to these lands. And as a result, they didn't differ from Scandinavia all that much. Bitter cold, urban centers created to facilitate trade, violent raiding, fierce warriors, and eventually, a conversion to Christianity. There were many powerful states that traded and competed with each other, but the most powerful among them was by far Kiev. Hence the name. Right. Moscow at the time was just a backwater Eve. village, not worth marking on the map. And St. Petersburg wasn't even founded yet. So what changed that? Well, who changed that? Genghis Khan, of course. It's the video. No. Temujin picked the best... It was... 
Okay, it was uh, yeah, hand. It was his uh, grandson. And then trained them to perfection, which is why they pulled off what no one has even attempted to do. They invaded Russia in the winter. Oh yeah, both Napoleon and Hitler it. attacked Russia in the early summer, <laughs> but not the Mongols. Mongols like to play on hardcore mode. They, they could fight anywhere but jungles, basically. Jungles that really stopped them down in like Vietnam and stuff. It's not as good for, you know, horseback and all that. They launched several armies hundreds of miles apart, consistently exchanging messages and handling logistics in a way that honestly wouldn't be seen again until maybe World War I. They galloped over frozen rivers and sacked city after city. Vladimir, Ryazan, Suzdal, Yaroslavl, and most importantly, Kiev. All were put to the torch. Once all the big cities were annihilated, the rest bent the knee and began paying tribute. Power shifted Centuries. from the south to the north. Novgorod was one of the few left untouched, allowing it to become a new center of power as a Mongol ally. The, no the, the, the whole, like, influence for the Mongols over Russia, too, is, again, they didn't really, like, directly rule over it, but it really developed this culture in Russia. It was kind of like a mutt of, like, like they said, like the Nordic culture that had come in, Europe, Central Europe, you know, being there too, but but then Asia as well. So it had this like big mud of cultures. And it's also why when they eventually get their independence, they didn't look and feel very European. I mean, yeah, they're Christian, but they were like Russian Orthodox and had more much uh, more tied to that than Catholicism. Uh, but it took a long time really until probably Peter the Great, when you say, where Russia really starts looking, feeling European. Nomads weren't interested in governing. They were happy to just let their subjects live their lives, pray to whichever god yeah. they wanted, while That's keeping the, the peace and receiving tribute. In the Sorry, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm interrupting too much. Again, this is one of my favorite topics and uh, one I, I, I feel like I know a lot more about. But um, the, their policy of tolerance was so interesting because it's like they didn't care what religion you were. They didn't expect you to convert to their belief system because their belief system is tied to their land and you can't really like convert to it. You know what I mean? So they didn't care. I didn't care what religion you were. Um, and they were just like, just give us money. Give us money. Give us troops or whatever. Pledge your allegiance to us. And we're good. So it's amazing. It's such a brutal conquering empire. Um, also was one of the most tolerant of empires. Way more tolerant than like the Romans or something like that. Term, the region spiraled into decline. But over time, this stability and external foe allowed a new identity to be forged. Eventually, the backwater city of Moscow would sack Novgorod and establish the Tsardom of Russia, but not in this timeline. Ironically, this region could resemble the Mongol homeland quite a bit. Fierce warriors trading in the cold, only on boats instead of fancy ponies, clashing with each other, but ultimately depending on the Byzantine Empire, which exerted a lot of force on them, hence the Orthodox Christianity. Similarly to the Mongol steppe, Byz this the Byzantine Empire wouldn't have conquered them. They, they, they wouldn't have spread into Russia. This region was also very isolated, and the perpetual rivalries would make it very difficult for one state to rise above the rest. At best, one could hope for a momentary powerhouse, which is eventually toppled by a coalition of other smaller houses. The Mongol overlords came and went, creating a reset that just wouldn't happen in any other way. <laughs> Without the Mongols, millions would be spared a brutal death. But overall, True. the Kievan Rus would remain a stagnant and peripheral playground, which just doesn't get involved in the fate of its neighbors. Hmm. Try to think if I processed the, enough of their information to to back the whole Kievan thing, because my original thought would that they would be stronger. Um, but just by existing and not having to deal with the Mongols, you know, but I don't know, I'll take us out to revisit that. What do you think? Constantinople had just been sacked. Merchant republics were on the rise. The emperor was waging war with the Pope. The Christian kingdoms just won the Reconquista, and overall European monarchs were moving away from feudalism and beginning to centralize their states. The same Mongol invasion that crossed the continent and stomped over... Feudalism, the though, didn't end until much after that, much further after that. I mean, like, France took the French Revolution to do that stuff. Um, feudalism wasn't really... It was replaced by capitalism, essentially, which is still not going to be... It's still going to be centuries away decided to go a little farther go the extra mile for the fun of it on this final leg of their journey they encountered european heavy cavalry 
superior siege weapons, stone fortresses, oh, things that gave them a run for their money. But at the end of the day, Mongols know how to give them a fun thing. challenge that they plan to get back to before canceling the sequel. Despite venturing into unknown territory, they split their army in two. One half raised Poland to the ground and killed its king, while the other half dealt with Hungary, a kingdom on the rise, ruled by Bela IV, a highly intelligent monarch who centralized his domain and ushered in reforms. <laughs> Wasn't he, was he the one too that was trying to uh, get the Pope to, to show up? He's like, Pope, the Mongols are about to enter Europe and destroy us. Like, come help us. And like, there was no help. Hungary in the same weight category as France. After he was chased off to a Dalmatian island, the country suffered a 60% yeah. population loss and would never recover. <laughs> the West was like, On their nah, way back, the Mongols got this, passed bro. through the Balkans <laughs> and destroyed everything in their path, including the blossoming kingdoms of Serbia and Bulgaria. The latter of which just triumphed over the Fourth Crusade and started a golden era of its own, much like Quaresmia the Bulgarian and Georgia. Golden Age. Hungary and Bulgaria were the unknown superpowers to be that were stripped away from their opportunity. That's a good point. States That's a good point. Road. We'd actually be talking about Hungary and Bulgaria today um, as massive empires there. Yeah, that, I totally Rise, agree. Who this were part. well led, centralized, had a well defined culture and identity that were beginning to spread on a regional level. Years prior to the invasion of 1241, Bulgaria almost took Constantinople from the Latin Empire, while Hungary finally freed itself from the overwhelming control of the nobility. Think of states like Castile, France, England. Think of the moment they were about to enter the limelight and imagine an alien invasion which just comes Castile? in, trashes the place, and leaves, never to be seen again. Castile never formed Spain. France is splintered into city-states. England... I think we're well, getting, we're getting like, indirectly, 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 you know, too many dominoes, I feel like, are, are going down now. We actually know how that turned out for England. Between Hungary, Poland, and Bulgaria, Bill IV had the biggest Hungarian start, Empire, man. Arguably that would have been a better one than anyone in Europe. Beast. His only downside being that he was sandwiched between the other two, but neither Pope nor Emperor posed a significant threat. As for Poland and Bulgaria, well, their existential threat was none other than the Russians and Ottomans, respectively. And as we already discussed there, neither of those are getting formed yeah. in this timeline. That means yeah. Poland early on unites under a strong national identity with a Go distinct Poland. language. As for the Bulgarians, under we the We should Asimov, appreciate Polish names. Look at this. National identity with a distinct These type language. of names. <laughs> So many Z's and Polish. As for the Bulgarians, under the Assen dynasty, they would aim to become the restorers of the Byzantine Empire. Anatolia remains under the influence really? of the Sultanate yeah. of Rome, while the Orthodox Eastern Roman Empire gets reforged and rebranded by the Bulgarians, who take over the Eastern Balkans. This is still, though, I, I feel like he's, he's talking so much about the growth of these other kingdoms, but not the potential ones that have grown in the Middle East. Um, again, like like the Abbasids, I feel like not a lot is being talked about in this scenario about what would have happened to them. He's just kind of saying, eh, what what golden age was already over?" Well, you know, I feel like that could could still have been. I feel like I don't know. I was thinking that they would have filled potentially the Ottoman Empire's role. And if you think that sounds a bit too crazy, just look up how many different dynasties ruled over the Byzantines over the years, usually from completely different corners yes. of the empire. Not as insane as you might think. Well, that was a wild ride. After doing a bunch of research, honestly, each of these regions could be its own separate video. Not to mention, I didn't even get to cover the effects oh, this scenario yeah. would have on the Black Plague. Yeah, it was through the Pony Express network that the Mongols built that laid the foundations for the plague to spread. But honestly, the Black Plague not happening is like a whole separate video on its own. The f it would have been interesting. It could have been more confined. I mean, I still think... So the whole thing was the... the with. The Mongols basically conquered like the entire Silk Road, right? And because they they conquered it, they also uh, understood the value of it and took incredible and went to incredible lengths to protect it. And uh, that brought in the what they call the second golden age of the um, of the Silk Road. First one being back with like the Han Dynasty in Rome, but that Mongol era of them controlling that also 
uh, made the Silk Road a technological superhighway. It's how gunpowder, you know, for example, got to the West, paper making and, and all of these other things because they literally controlled all of it. There probably would have been a slower transmission of technologies uh, too, if that, because a big influence is going to be the gunpowder empires are going to come out of this. So that's Ottoman, Safavid, Mughal Empire. And in this scenario, they're saying they all, who all got influence from from the Mongols, you know, wouldn't have existed or not existed like they did. So I, yeah, I think technologically things would have uh, really slowed down. The fact that removing a single person would result in the absence of empires that did so much to shape the world is bonkers. Especially, but you can do that with in him. the middle of the Mongolian. He's unlike step. any other but ruler. But there's a lesson there. If you ever want to reshape the world, just uh, be really good at horseback riding and shooting arrows. You can do anything if you put your mind to it. Oh wow! You made it through the whole video. Yeah. Good job. It's been over a decade since I started making these, and as cheesy as it sounds, no this way. really wouldn't be possible without viewers like you. Just watching videos goes a long way. I love this channel. Other ways such a great channel. Out, I love such alternate as supporting history me stuff. on Patreon. But I think for supporting the alternate channel, history, huh? viewers should get something more out of it, you know? So that's why I'm revamping the Patreon and bringing back the Discord server. Hey. On the surface, yeah, Patreon, Discord, whatever. But I want these to be very different than what's out there. So first, supporting me on Patreon not only helps the see. channel, but I need also good ideas you for one stuff. extra monthly video. I have a Patreon. By Thank you to my Patreon. Player by the voting way. system. It sounds confusing, but it's less complex than an American election. You can pick topics, choose which ones make it, and even get your own stick figure. Meanwhile, over on Discord, I'm trying something new. I'm trying to turn history into a fun multiplayer game with hundreds of players all writing essays, debating, role-playing, all kinds of fun stuff like that that lets them expand their very own states on a dynamic world map. That's cool. Yes, really. Patreon members get all sorts of That sounds of perks, fun. But the thing is, anyone is able to join in and live out their dream of playing a total war slash paradox amalgamation online with no lag. So yeah, yeah, that's the announcement. Uh, whether you just some to jerks the don't Patreon, ruin it for everyone. Join the Discord you know I mean? map game, or just we all know <laughs> Discord can be toxic, man. Move on with your day. Thanks for making it this far. This is Cody of Alternate History Hub. That statue is so cool. Just out in the middle of nowhere. You go to like Kambala or not Kambala. Um, it's Beijing. Uh, Karakoram, and still see some of the stuff that was there, but. Again, if you go there, you'd be like, that was the biggest empire ever that, you know, came from this, you know. <laughs> All right, final thoughts. All right, so this was a good one to unpack because, you know, the Mongols not existing would have created so many timelines, so many different timelines as they were such a massive empire. Wouldn't wouldn't be a linear thing. It'd be a, you know, big tree. And um, I think it gave my, my thoughts on it. There was plenty of stuff I agreed with. There's also some things I think, at least from just, again, what I know, um, I think would be different than what they said. But you heard what I said about that. So I'd love to know what you guys think. What do you think about some of these alternate histories and how you think they would have been affected? Let me know down in the comments. All right. And with that, y'all, we'll see you next time. Bye.